Um, I hope you find it valuable. Basically, what we want to talk about tonight is um, you know, where total knee and total hip replacement is, um, what it is, what it isn't, what your expectation should be as a patient for it, what kind of outcomes you should expect from it. And um, I hope we can um, really have a good discussion about where healthcare policy is going and how that's going to affect us all as patients in the future. Um, and most importantly, I hope we um, have a good deal of time for question and answer. I'm not going to leave until I've answered everybody's question. Um, this is a beeper, and I'm on call tonight. So, <laughs> so there is a chance the beeper could go off, but I, I don't have to leave. So that's the good thing about this. You know, whenever you do a medical discussion these days, one of the things that we begin with are disclosures. And um, I think there's a real, um, I think these are very important because I think when you're hearing information about healthcare, it's very important to understand whether or not there are any economic conflicts that we might have. You know, in other words, am I getting paid by a company to give a talk or anything like that? And so these are pretty much common things that we do now when we have medical discussions. So, you know, I'm the medical director of surgical services at uh, Lakeland for all their sites. Uh, I'm on several board committees, but I don't have any financial relationships with any uh, companies. Um, and so today what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about, you know, exactly what is arthritis and make sure we understand that. You know, what is total joint surgery? We're going to talk about um, some of the new uh, technology uh, aspects of total joint surgery, what they are and what they aren't. Um, we're going to talk about exactly what does that term minimally invasive surgery mean. I really want to spend some time about where I think the future is going and then and again answering your questions. Arthritis is a huge public health issue right now. I wouldn't say problem, it's just the consequence of us getting older and it uh, involves more than 50 million Americans right now. And so if you look at um, how arthritic conditions have escalated, you know, we can look at 1995 and we can compare it to projections of 2020, and we can see that almost 60 million people will be afflicted by arthritis uh, by 2020, and that is a major deal. Um, it's a really major deal because we're going to do 719,000 total knees in the United States this year, about 332,000 total hips about 53,000 total shoulders, and 54,000 revision uh, knee replacements. And um, the reason this is a big deal is that total hip and total knee replacements comprise the biggest procedural component of the Medicare budget. Okay, so when we look at Medicare budgets, and we're talking about procedures, those two account for the largest procedural expense. So it's pretty uh, easy to understand that what is the, one of the things that the future holds is cost containment. Uh, that's going to be done with quality improvement, and it's going to be done with proper patient selection, and we're going to talk about that uh, at length. So when you talk about just total knees alone, there are 4.5 million of us as Americans that are living with total knees, mostly women. Um, that the incidence of these operations has increased by 84% since 1997. It's the fourth highest reason for a hospital stay in the United States, and it costs about $9 billion right now. So we're talking major, major expenses. And if you look at the future, these are graphs of the predicted trend lines for total joints, primary total joints, which means your first total joint. Um, you can see total knees going through the roof along with total hip replacements. And then revisions, the more you do, the more that you're going to have to redo. Um, revision rates are escalating. And revision rates are uh, particularly troublesome because revision surgery is extremely expensive. And so the whole key is let's do the first one as, as good as we can so that it lasts as long as we can. So, when we start talking about what, what can you do about arthritis, let's talk about the non-operative things that you can do about arthritis. You know, again, arthritis by definition is a loss of cartilage over bone, so bone rubs on bone. So bone rubs on bone in your shoulder, your knees, or your hips, okay? And, you know, first we talk about diet and exercise, and um, I don't think there are any nutritional supplements that you can eat that will put cartilage on bone, but I think uh, having good muscle tone around your joints helps reduce the discomfort that you have. 
Obviously, there are medications. You know, many, many of us take anti-inflammatory medicines, Aleve, Advil, Mobic, Voltaren, all those medications. Um, there is a role in some patients for physical therapy, particularly for patients who have very advanced arthritis and have become very physically deconditioned because I think, as we're going to talk about, the effort that it takes to recover from total joints is pretty substantial. And if you're very deconditioned before you enter into that endeavor, it's going to just make it more difficult. So some patients will go to therapy. Arthroscopy is something that I want to talk about because very often, every day when I'm uh, in the office, I'll see somebody who had a scope 20 years ago. Dr. Lisher did my knee scope. And um, my knee hurts again, so I want to have it scoped again. And we take an x-ray, and it shows bone on bone. And people think that you can just uh, put a scope in, clean it out. That'll do great. And for many years, we did do that. And then five years ago, two papers came out, one in the Journal of the American Medical Association and another in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, which is sort of like our Bible, showed that there was absolutely no difference in outcome between patients that had a scope and patients that had a cortisone injection. Medicare reads all the journals, and therefore Medicare no longer reimburses for arthroscopy strictly for arthritis. And that's reasonable because it's an unnecessary operation that really doesn't do very much. So injections are a component of treating an arthritic knee non-operatively, and we're going to talk about the three types of injections. And then when the, all those, so I always consider those things, you know, the injections, the medicine, the activity modification, they're all the treatments that we can offer that can treat the symptoms but don't necessarily treat the problem. Okay, and for some people, that's fine. That's all they want. If we're going to treat the problem, then we're going to talk about either partial joint replacements or total joint replacements. Or we can get the willow curve. Okay, so the, I love this thing. It cracks me up. So, so the willow curve is that thing that Chuck, Chuck Lowry has now become the salesman for all the, the crazy things for total joints. So the willow curve, if you look at the willow curve, they got some football player who said he didn't have to have a joint replacement because he bought the willow curve. So I did some research on the willow curve. The willow curve costs $599, and the willow curve just produces heat around your knee, but that's interesting. So if the willow curve doesn't work, then you can get the Australian dream cream, okay? <laughs> okay, and this is also something that he's pushing, okay? And you can slobber that on your knee, I guess, and that'll make it better. But, but you know, when we talk about uh, real medicine, we, we begin by talking about injections. So what are the things that we can inject in patients? And, uh, you know, pretty much there are three things. There's cortisone, there's hyaluronic acid, which is the rooster comb injections that you hear about. Um, and then there's something called platelet-rich plasma, which if you listen to Chicago radio, you hear a lot about, and I want to talk a little bit about that tonight. So cortisone is uh, the mainstay. Cortisone is an extremely effective, inexpensive, um, local anti-inflammatory that reduces the inflammatory response to arthritis. People often say, well, why do you get pain when you get arthritis? Well, you get pain because you get bone contacting bone that produces debris in the knee. The synovial lining of the knee, which is like a vacuum cleaner, sucks that in and then part of the digestion of those components is to make a chemical called prostaglandin. And cortisone just turns that off, okay? so. Again, cortisone doesn't change the fact that you've got bone on bone, but it reduces the inflammatory and painful response to that bone on bone. Um, usually the relief is pretty quick. There are, um, you know, most people get relief in two to five days. Uh, I know there's somebody here I injected yesterday and I saw her limping in, so it didn't work in one day. Um, <laughs> but in general, you know, two to five days, and in most people it works. I think the thing that is, um, uh, difficult to talk uh, to patients about is how long is it going to last. And so I tell patients two weeks to two years because that's what I've seen with cortisone. Now cortisone you can't give over and over and over again because cortisone can unbundle collagen, which is the major structural fiber of cartilage. So you can actually accelerate arthritic degeneration if you get too much cortisone. Um, so. In the old days, you'd hear about people getting, oh, you know, my neighbor got 20 injections of cortisone. Well, you know, there may be reasons for that. Maybe the patient's too sick to consider other options. 
Uh, or maybe it's the wrong thing to do. Uh, you know, and so if your physician's telling you we're going to give you your 10th cortisone injection in the last two years, that, that may not be the best thing for you. Okay, so what are these Roostacomb injections, these hyaluronic acid injections? Um, they go by many different names, uh, Synvisc, Hyligan, Suparts, and, you know, hyaluronic acid is a major component of normal joint fluid, and um, basically, I think the way you should think about those injections as, as a joint lubricant uh, can be effective, um, and it can be effective in lubricating and maybe in load transmission, very, very expensive. Okay, when, when hyaluronic acid first came out, Suparts and Synvisc injections, a lot of primary care doctors were giving these injections pretty freely. And it was pretty, pretty expensive and a pretty significant burden on, uh, on patients if they had any high deductible. And I think with this medicine, the effectiveness of this medicine is really being debated. Um, it doesn't hurt you, so it, it doesn't hurt you. But um, there have been a lot of studies that have looked at its efficacy compared to placebo, and it's less than impressive. So works in some people, doesn't work in others. Um, and there's really very little literature support for repeated administration. In fact, the FDA authorizes the administration of this stuff for two cycles of injection. So as you know, you either get three to five injections. Um, they had one formulation of this where you gave one injection, but it was basically giving three doses of one injection. I did that three times over three, um, painful patients. Um, so. Um, I think the jury's out on this. It doesn't hurt you, but um, you know I'm not sure how, uh, how great a job it does. Now, the other thing that's been advertised very heavily in the Chicago market is platelet-rich plasma. And you know, we're all, you know, really for the last 12 years, 15 years, you know, we've all been thinking about stem cells. You know, what are stem cells? I remember President Bush having a conference uh, about stem cells and having a message to the American people about stem cells. But uh, basically what platelet-rich plasma is, they, they take some blood from you, they spin it down, and then part of that um, centrifuge material is re-injected into your knee. It's got concentrated growth elements in it. But, um, <clears throat> and it can have a powerful anti-inflammatory effect, but there's not a single study in the literature that shows it does anything about arthritis. So, you know, again, I told you that arthritis is a loss of cartilage over bone. So we're all looking for what is that magic medicine that's gonna make my knee like a chia pet, you know, where the grass starts growing in it. And, and you know, the bottom line is there is nothing like that and there's nothing on the horizon. So when we look at biologic solutions to arthritis, they just aren't there. And I think when you look at injectables, you shouldn't think about this is making my arthritis go away. It's just making your symptoms get better. And for many, many people, that's, that's terrific. But, um, you know, a lot of these things are really confused by the amount of marketing that goes on. And, you know, when I was a resident, um, you know, in between 1987 and 1991, we used to have drug reps and equipment reps and all those people come in and talk to the doctors, always talk to the doctors. And then everybody realized that there's a real ethical conflict with that, and, and drug manufacturers and equipment manufacturers realized, why are we talking to the doctors? We're going to go talk to the patients. And, you know, so the amount of spending that goes on in direct-to-market, this is from 2005, the numbers are astronomical now. You know, when you start thinking about it, I had a woman the other night ask me about, you know, you remember from a couple of years ago, they used to talk about the woman's knee you know, the woman's total knee replacement. And then there are other, drug com other equipment companies are talking about get a knee replacement, you could go run a marathon and climb mountains and do things like that. So there's a lot of direct advertising to patients now that, you know, really is uh, not giving the full story about these operations. And uh, tonight I want to talk to you about sort of the facts of life when it comes to this. So if we tried all these conservative measures and you still have pain, you know, who, who become candidates for knee and hip replacement? And I've got Edward's four criteria. Number one, you have to have x-rays that uh, show you have significant arthritis. Number two, you have to be healthy enough to have the surgery. Number three, you have to have tried and failed conservative measures. 
And number four, it has to be significantly affecting the quality of your life. And uh, I think that's really the nut. You know, what's the quality of life? Quality of life isn't, you know, running a marathon. Quality of life is I can't walk in the store, uh, my sleep is disturbed, I can't travel. Every time I want to do something, I'm thinking about my knee or my hip. You know, those are the quality of life issues. I can't enjoy my grandchildren, you know, blah, blah. So those are the things. And so we want to optimize people's medical status. And optimizing, you know, so when we talk about the pressures that we're going to be under when we're selecting patients to do joint replacements right now, one of the big topics that we're going to talk about is surgical optimization. Um, I just watched a webinar from NYU last night, and they were talking about how they gain cost control of their total joint program in New York City. And one of the ways they got control of it is they became more selective about the patients that they operate on. And, and I think this is about to really hit home throughout the United States. So in the, in the past, somebody would come in, they had terrible knee arthritis, and we'd say, my schedule's free two weeks from Thursday, and we'd get you on the schedule. And I think, at least in most practices, those days are changing. And so I think there are a couple of conditions that we need to talk about. First of all, you know, smoking. Um, you know, I think one of the things, you know, my, my, both my parents have passed away from lung cancer, <laughs> big smokers, and so I'm very sensitive to, to cigarette smoking. But, uh, but I also know how difficult it is to stop smoking. And, and I think one of the mistakes we make when we're counseling patients preoperatively is say, just got to quit. And you got to quit for the rest of your life. And we, we don't tell patients why, but you know, if you can quit smoking for four weeks before your surgery, the physiological benefits are bring you back to an almost norm, near normal status from a respiratory standpoint. It's amazing the changes that can improve just with four weeks of quitting smoking. Um, BMI. So we know that if your BMI is over 40, that your risk of infection in total knee replacement is nine times that of somebody who's under 40. So we don't say you're too heavy, we're not gonna do your knee surgery, but the approach of surgical optimization is to say, you know, we need to work with you and help you lose weight. And we've got great programs. We, Dr. Shutnik runs a phenomenal uh, weight loss program at Lakeland. So we partner with our colleagues on that. We talked about physical deconditioning. I think to take somebody who hasn't been walking and say, we're going to go do your knee replacement means you'll have a beautiful x-ray but a pretty dysfunctional patient because we're asking a lot of patients physically postoperatively and they're, they haven't done any physical activity. Uh, diabetes is a big deal. I think we strive to get your hemoglobin A1C under 7.5 because the literature shows if your hemoglobin A1C is above that, your risk of infection is much higher than if it's below that. Um, you know, emphysema, we try to uh, you know, do that. Alcohol abuse can be a problem. And this is a big one, preoperative narcotics. If you've been reading the papers, you know that America is in the middle of an opioid epidemic. Um, you know, we use more opioids than any other country in, in the world. And uh, as an example, it, I was just looking at a study that compared hip fracture patients in the United States versus those in the Netherlands, okay? And they looked at the number of patients in the United States after a hip fracture that went home on narcotics and compared it to those in the Netherlands. In the United States, 85% of patients that break their hips go home with narcotics. In the Netherlands, zero. And that's, you know, there's cultural expectations, but there's also patient education. And about 10 years ago, we started a pain paradigm where, you know, and if you've been in the hospital, you've heard this, what's your scale, what's your pain on a scale of one to 10? You get asked that a million times, and it's almost a failure if you're not a zero. And we've, we've given patients this impression that you should be some, somehow anesthetized, even though you've had surgery or you've got arthritis and that. And so we've created this opioid problem. So one thing that's pretty clear, if you've been on preoperative narcotics before surgery, Norco, Percocet, things like that, your likelihood of being on narcotics seven months postoperatively after a total knee or hip 
is about 85%. Okay, so one of our goals is to get people, is to get patients cared for before they get to that point where they're on chronic narcotics. Um, so th this is a little bit about surgical optimization. You're going to hear more about this uh, in the future. So, excuse me. Excuse me. It's my lovely daughter. Um, so, um, so, um, so let's talk specifically about total knee replacement. Um, and um, let me just silence this. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. Good. So, um, so when you talk about a knee, a knee is basically three cartilage-covered bony surfaces. You have a kneecap, you have a thigh bone, and you have a shin bone. And when you look at a normal knee, Cartilage is represented by space. If you have cartilage, you'll have space between the bones. And the x-ray on the uh, right shows a narrowing or obliteration of the joint space. So that's what arthritis is. Loss of cartilage over bone, so bone rubs on bone. And you know, this is some post-operative <laughs> patients after, after uh, a knee replacement. Um, so, and we've seen that, and they're happy customers. But, but basically, what is a knee replacement? I think. When we talk about knee replacement, think of it as a resurfacing operation. It's an operation in which we put um, pieces of metal on the end of the thigh bone, a piece of metal on top of the shin bone, and then there's a plastic liner on top of that piece of metal. And um, so what we can see here, metal on the thigh bone, metal on the shin bone, plastic spacer in the middle, and then on the undersurface of the kneecap, we remove about 10 millimeters of bone, and we put a little plastic button on the undersurface of the kneecap. So you keep most of your kneecap, but you have this little plastic button on it, and that resurfaces it. So what we're able to do with that is we're able to uh, get rid of the painful bone-on-bone -bone contact, and we're also able to realign the knee, and that's what a knee replacement looks like. Now, post-operatively, what you can see is that the knee looks nice and straight, metal on the end of the thigh bone, on top of the shin bone, Plastic spacer in the middle. You can't see plastic on an x-ray. And this is what it looks like from the side. And so how do we use modern technology? You know, what is computer assisted? What is robotics? What does all that mean? Well, basically what it means is that we're using some technological things to improve the accuracy of the alignment of these components. Um, and that's really what it comes about. And the theory is that if we can get the components lined up perfectly or as close to perfect as possible, that we will reduce the amount of wear in those components and the longevity of those components theoretically will uh, be greater. So, you know, what do people worry about when they're gonna have joint replacement? They worry about pain and they worry about, am I gonna have to do this again? You know, they, is it gonna last? So this is one of those things that we're using to try to improve that. And if you look at what computer navigation means, it basically, just think of it as like GPS in the operating room. So basically what we do is we take instruments and we affix them to bone and they communicate with a camera, okay? And then we look at a screen and that tells us whether or not we're getting things properly aligned. Um, and this is basically what this looks like. It's a little cart that has the um, camera on it and then we look at this screen, and these little trackers get affixed to the patient's bone as we do that. It's, it's really, it's amazing technology. Um, but it doesn't replace a surgeon's skills. You know, so when you think of big computer assisted, um, computer assisted um, total joint replacement, or you think about robotics, it's not like we push a button and go get coffee. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, it just helps us verify that we have aligned things properly. So it gives us real-time guidance uh, in the operating room. And um, so I think the next thing that's very important to talk about with total knee replacements is expectations. So, you know, I'll give you a great uh, anecdotal story. I operated on a fellow two days ago, and he said to me, boy, my knee really hurts today. And I thought, well, it's supposed to hurt today. Um, but, you know, that really it really emphasized to me how we need to be so much more transparent with our patients about what their expectation should be immediately after surgery and what the course of, of recovery is. 
uh, as far as total needs. Because you know, when you look at when, when you look at today's healthcare environment, um, and you're thinking about getting a knee replacement, you're getting bombarded with images and perceptions of rapid recovery and return to normal life with high levels of function. And you're thinking that that's going to happen instantly. And we're doing that collectively as the orthopedic community because we want you to sign up for surgery here, you know. And in a sense, we're, um, we're, we're not meeting our patients' expectations as we should. I just read an article that said up to 20% of patients with total knee replacements feel that their expectations for surgery had not been met in the first six months. And that doesn't mean that the surgeries were done poorly. It means that we oversold the surgery. We said that you're going to get better and run, you know, jump higher and run faster quickly. And in fact, what we have to tell patients is that it's going to take you, that you'll notice continuing improvement with the total knee replacement for 12 to 18 months postoperatively. And, um, and, you have to, and you have to prepare patients for you know, the fact that the first six weeks are the most challenging. I tell patients two things before knee replacements, every one of my patients. This is an operation I do with you, not to you. So we'll put it in right. You know, we've got all sorts of stuff to verify that. But you've got to make it work. So by that, I'm telling a patient that you've got to be a participant in your care. The second thing is I tell them the first six weeks are for the birds, okay, because the first six weeks are the most difficult, the most challenging when it comes to bending your knee and walking and doing things like that. If you don't tell patients that, on the second post-operative day, they're going to go, what'd you do to me? You know? But if you ask patients down the road, the most important question, which is, compared to the pain that you had before surgery, how does your knee feel now? They won't even let you finish the sentence because they're that satisfied. So, um, so we also were trying to get clued into what are some of the risk factors for patients being dissatisfied? Well, one is the use of preoperative narcotics that we talked about. But diabetes, socioeconomic status seems to have a role, level of preoperative pain, depression, overselling the operation, telling people that you're going to go out and run a marathon after a total knee replacement. That's the wrong thing to tell patients. You're going to be able to run with your grandchildren. You can play doubles tennis. You can golf. You can ski. But if you tell patients you're going to, you're going to be 20 years old again, that's not what a knee replacement's supposed to be. And... Um, so, and we also have to tell patients that there are a couple of annoying things that everybody gets. So if you've had a knee replacement, you know that they make noise, certainly initially after you have it. We talked about how you've got plastic things banging against metal things. 79% of patients in the United States have some level of clicking or noise in their knee in the first year after a knee replacement. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the knee replacement, just that's how it is. And if you don't tell patients that, they'll go, what's wrong with my knee? Is my knee breaking? 69% um, uh, of patients will have some numbness around the incisional area that has no functional significance because there are no muscles innervated by those nerves. But if you don't tell people, they'll think you cut a nerve. Um, um, some people will have difficulties kneeling or squatting. Patients always ask, can I kneel? Am I going to break my knee when I kneel? Well, the answer is no, and the way I answer that is um, you're not going to do irrevocable harm to your knee by kneeling on it, but it may be sore, certainly in the first year, and so I encourage people as they want to garden and do things, you know, go buy a knee pad or use a pillow to kneel on uh, that, and initially you're going to have a slower walking speed. But having said that, 93% of American patients are satisfied with total knees at uh, five years. There's a consistent reduction in preoperative pain. And it continues to progress over the course of 18 months. And, you know, when we talk about quality, you know, in the past we used to talk about quality as did I get an infection, did, uh, did the knee loosen, did you have to redo it? And those were all the quality things that we looked at. So really focusing on the catastrophes that happen with knee, re knee replacements or hip replacements. But one of the things that you're all going to be involved in if you decide to do knee and hip replacements, at least in Michigan, is something that we call patient reported outcomes. So basically what um, doctors are interested in, hospitals are interested in, insurance companies are interested in, is how much of an improvement did you get by doing these operations? You know, we can do the operation, we can look at the x-rays and it looks great, and you didn't get infected and your knee didn't loosen, but did you get better? Did it meet your expectations? 
And patient reported outcomes are going to become a big, big part of the quality picture and the transparency with which we talk to patients. So in our practice, we just you know, began this because we're part of a quality collaborative in Michigan. You know, we are giving surveys to patients before surgery at about three months, and then you'll get one at a year, and we're going to start tracking them. And in our practice, you know, one of the things about our practice and, you know, the physicians that I practice with at Lakeland, we're part of a quality collaborative in Michigan called Marquee in which the 40 biggest, uh, busiest programs for total joint replacements all share quality data in a very transparent way. We meet four times a year, and we put slides up, and it shows you know, what the infection rate at Lakeland is compared to Beaumont, compared to Henry Ford. And, and it's very interesting how all that quality stuff has narrowed. And that's been very good for the patients in Michigan, um, that we're transparent and we're being very open about the quality um, aspect. And I think the biggest advance in total knee replacements has been how we treat people's pain at the time of the surgical event. And uh, the term that we use is multimodal anesthesia. And this is using a bunch of different types of medications and delivery routes to give people the best post-operative pain control that we can. So um, it used to be you'd do surgery with general anesthesia and you'd wake up and um, we'd put you on a PCA pump, which was a, like a morphine or Demerol or something of that nature, and it'd be miserable. Um, and that has really improved. So preoperatively, we give people either IV Tylenol or Celebrex. Now, IV Tylenol is interesting. IV Tylenol, if you give IV Tylenol, it's got the pain equivalence of 10 milligrams of morphine. So it's interesting. Sometimes we'll see patients and they'll, they'll see that we hung up uh, IV Tylenol in the room postoperatively, and they go, you're not giving me anything. You're only giving me IV Tylenol. And then you tell them it's the equivalent of 10 milligrams of morphine and it, it's better. So we give people preoperative pain medication Intraoperatively, we really encourage patients to consider spinal anesthesia. It gives a much better anesthetic experience for patients. We also, in most of our patients, use something called an adductor block, which is a block in the knee that takes away most of the pain in the knee. And then we also, in all patients, we give an injection into the knee, into the soft tissues around the knee. So I would say 95% of our patients have no pain in the first 24 hours after a knee replacement. And that's a big deal because if you can get patients through that first 24 hours, you can get their knee bending, you can have a very high quality physical therapy experience. You're really on the way to getting patients um, under control and really rehabbed well. And then postoperatively, it means we're giving less narcotics, which means you're throwing up less, you don't feel as crummy. Um, we use a lot of ice therapy, IV Tylenol, and early mobilization. But this has made a huge difference in patient satisfaction postoperatively. Now let's talk a little bit about what a partial knee is because I think almost every patient that I talk to about knee arthritis says, well, can I just have a partial? And so let me explain what that is. A partial knee replacement has had a lot of interest over the last decade. It's done through a very small incision. And basically, a partial knee replacement is an operation in which we replace just one half of the knee, okay? Um, and it's, uh, this is uh, one brand, this is the one that we use called the Oxford knee. Um, but basically, what is it meant for? Well, it's not meant for everybody. It's only meant for about five to 6% of patients with knee arthritis. You have to have a minimal deformity. Um, your arthritis has to be limited just to one side of the knee. And usually it's best suited for older, thinner, less active patients. Um, and, and I think as we look in the future of this operation, we're really looking at what's the pain relief of that operation compared to a total knee replacement. Uh, the 10-year data is very encouraging about this. And can we expand the indications a little bit? Um, should we be using it in more of our patients? Um, Good operation, uh, I think it's just one of the many tools in our toolbox to, to help people pain. But you have to very specifically only have arthritis on one part of your knee. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna shift gears and we're gonna talk about total hip replacement. Um, total hip replacement, frankly, is a mir miraculous operation. Um, uh, the Canadians who have to justify every operation that they do 
have studied quality improvement and improvement in productivity with all the operations that are done in patients over the age of 60. And there is no operation that scores higher than hip replacement. So when you go to Canada, you may have to wait in line to get a hip replacement, but you're not going to get turned down to have a hip replacement. So the uh, second operation was knee replacement, by the way. But So this is the doubtful sound in New Zealand. Um, so when we talk about hip replacement, so again, let's talk about how a hip is made. Well, a hip is a ball that fits in a socket. So the ball has cartilage on it, and the socket has cartilage in it. And when you have a normal hip, you have space between that area. When you look at the x-ray on the right, you can see that there's no space, bone on bone, and that's what an arthritic hip looks like. Okay. So what is a hip replacement exactly? Well, a hip replacement is uh, an operation in which we place a metal socket where your socket is, and that has a plastic liner in it. And then down the canal of the bone, there's a metal piece that has a metal ball on it, and then that metal ball fits in the socket. Sometimes that ball is made of ceramic. Um, and this is what uh, a picture of a total hip looks like uh, when it's in. Um, and how do we do it? Well, the first thing we do is we remove the femoral head. So we just basically chop off the ball. And um, then we, uh, we do that with a saw, and away that goes. And then, um, then what we do is, um, so then we're looking at the socket. And the socket is typically in arthritic patients, very irregular. And so what we want to do is we want to make the socket more regular. And so we have these things that are called acetabular reamers, um, probably more commonly known to us all as a cheese grater. And, um, and they come in various diameters. And what we do is we use these tools to fashion the socket to accept a um, hemispherical component, um, which is uh, made of metal. And you know this is showing insertion of the metal component into the socket or the acetabulum. That's what uh, the socket is called, the acetabulum. After we've done that, then we, we have um, bones are hollow. So we have rasps that allow us to fashion the interior of the thigh bone. and um, these rasps are the same shape as the component that we put in the thigh bone. So then we put a femoral stem down the canal. And the femoral stem, you can, you can either cement it in place. We do that in people that have a very osteoporotic bone. Or in most patients, what we do is we basically press fit this in. So we fashion it so it fits very tightly in the canal. Um, and then after we're done with that, then we attach a ball onto the top of that stem that's either made out of metal or ceramic, and then we put everything back together. You know, when we talk about computer-assisted surgery, um, I don't think it's had a bigger impact than in total hip replacement. Um, in the, in, you know, when I was in training and early in my career, the way that you, you would put a cup in is it would have a little um, guide on it and the patient be laying on the side and you'd try to line that guide up and that would put the cup in the right position. And, you know, sometimes people will lean forward, sometimes they will lean backwards, sometimes they were heavy, sometimes they were skinny. And so throughout the country, there was a lot of variability in the placement of the socket in a hip replacement. And so dislocation became a real concern. And, you know, dislocation is a, is a real drag for patients. If the ball pops out of the socket, it hurts. It, you have to go to the emergency room to get it put back in. It, it's, it's really terrible. And this has really improved that. So what we do when we do a hip replacement is we affix a tracker onto the pelvis. And um, when we're doing that reaming that we talked about with those sort of cheese graters, we have a computer device that's telling me the exact angle that I'm reaming. And then after that, as we put in the cup, we, we use the same thing. So this is what I'm looking at on the screen when I, when I do a total hip replacement in a patient. And I'm able to tell exactly the position of the cup that I'm putting in. And this is extraordinary. This has reduced the incidence of hip dislocation just enormously in the United States. 
and has really reduced the incidence of revisions because of poor acetabular position. So it's really, this has been remarkable. This has been a complete game changer, not just in our practice at Lakeland, but in facilities that use this. Um, and so when we're done, that's what a total hip looks like. The cup is there. It looks like the ball is floating in space because there's a plastic liner in that metal shell. And then the stem is impacted down the canal. And you know, there are a variety of surgical approaches. This is one of those marketing things that people talk about. But basically, there are three ways that you can do a hip. And um, when we look at our data in the United States, most, uh, most people are doing posterior approaches. Um, some people do anterior approaches, and some do lateral approaches. I, I do and have done all three. Um, it's really more patient-specific. I think there's been a lot of, little bit of overselling of anterior approaches to the hip that aren't quite accurate. But basically, what is an anterior approach? You know, basically we make an incision in the front of the leg rather than the side of the leg. And uh, you go, you use an interval between muscles. Um, and, um, you know, but we have to use this table. This is the table that we use. This is called the HANA table. And, you know, it's a, it's a great way to do the operation. It helps us with leg length and that. And I, I think uh, about four, you know, probably two to four years ago, people were saying this is the superior way to do a hip replacement, but there have been uh, several papers that have just come out and shown no real difference in dislocation rates, no real difference in outcome after three weeks, higher rate of fractures, higher rate of nerve injury, and what's con most concerning is there may be a higher rate of uh, what we call aseptic loosening, which means that the stem isn't, the bone isn't growing into the stem, and people think that that may be because you don't get as good a view of the canal of the femur when you're doing it. So it's a good choice for some patients. We never do it in patients that have severe deformities or really, really heavy or have had previous hip surgery on that side. So it's a technique to use, but it's just one technique. And, and I would say in general, patients get, um, uh, you know, this is where the, you know, everything on the internet is true. Um, you know, this is where, you have to really discern advertising from medical fact, um, you know, when it comes to that. So how do people do? Um, this is my one and my, will be my only bungee jump of my life. Uh, so, um, so how do people do? Well, these are tremendous operations. Um, so the, as I said, the two questions that most patients ask me, how are you going to control my pain and how long are these things going to last? When we talk about how long are these things going to last, we talk about something called survivorship. Survivorship refers to, at certain time intervals, how many of these devices are still functioning. So when we look at 20-year survivorship, okay, total knees, 97% are functioning at 20 years, 85% of total hips, and that's actually up to 92 now, and total shoulders, about 88%. So that means... At 20 years, 97% of people still functioning with the total knee that they had put in. And it's interesting. I've been in practice here 23 years, and I'm seeing patients of mine that I operated on in 1993, 1994, and their knees look as good on x-ray as they did the day we put them in. These devices work unbelievably well, just great operations and life changers. And there's a tremendous benefit. You know, we talk about the public health cost. You know, unfortunately, I think politicians and Medicare looks at what does it cost? And they'll look at the enormous expenditure that we do in total joint replacement. But several authors have started to look at, well, what's the benefit? So we know the cost, what are the medical costs, but what are the indirect costs to patients, their inability to work, wages, loss, disability payments, and quality of life measures? And researchers have actually found that there's a net gain to society um, if patients have total knee replacements. It's amazing. And then when you look at who goes back to work, uh, Lombardi in Columbus, Ohio, where that other university is, um, he did a study where he found that 98% of patients went back to work. And what I found impressive is that about 90% of them went back to their regular job. So, you know, these operations really improve people's quality of life uh, and are tremendous. So, I guess to wrap it up, what does, what does the future hold? Well, the future holds a lot more patients. You know, um, 
I was born in 1958. I'm the second to last year of the baby boomers. And um, there are a lot of us. And so there are going to be a lot of total joints, which is going to create a tremendous cost burden. And I think, I think the response to that is, uh, I think if, if I can see the tea leaves right, I think there are going to be a couple of responses to that. Number one, I think there's going to have to be greater justification to do the surgery. In other words, you're going to have to demonstrate that you tried conservative measures. You're going to have to demonstrate that a patient has been surgically optimized so you can predictably reduce the incidence of infections, readmissions, things of that nature. But I also think you're going to see less centers doing total joints. And here's, here's how it's going to happen. What's going to happen is that facilities like ours are going to have to continue to participate in quality initiatives. And we're going to have to prove that we're doing high quality work. And we're going to have to prove that we're doing high quality work, that patient reported outcomes are superior, and that we're cost effective. And, and if you meet those three criteria, then you'll be designated a center of excellence to do joint replacement. I think that's going to happen in total joints. I think that's going to happen in spine. And it's going to happen in heart surgery. Because that's a way of containing costs. Politicians never want to say the ration word. So what they are doing instead is they're rationing based on quality. Uh, you're lucky. You live, in a, you live in a town where we have high quality services for that. Um, so that's going, to be, uh, that's going to be a challenge. Um, I think we're going to see more revision surgery because we're doing more surgery. Um, and then when we look at tissue engineering and biologics, again, I'd use that chia pet analogy. You know, we're not going to develop anything that's going to, you know, put hair in your head or put cartilage on your bone. But I think where biologics are going to have a place is are in, are in patients that are in their 20s and 30s when they had their first injury, you know, and trying to prevent arthritis as they get older. So I, I think that's where things are, are pretty much going with, with shoulder joint replacement in the future. So um, with that, I thank you for your attention. I hope it was informative and answer any questions that you might have.